Good evening and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this OIST Foundation and OIST uh, COVID-19 Science Update webinar. Uh, while everyone is signing in, we would love for you to write in chat where you are joining us from. Uh, we know there are a number of people joining from Okinawa, from other parts of Japan, uh, from the United States, and perhaps from other countries as, as well. So if you could please uh, write in the chat uh, and tell us where you're joining from, we would greatly appreciate that. Uh, so now that, oh, we have Okinawa starting off, us off. Excellent. Arlington, Massachusetts, Hawaii. Uh, another person from Okinawa, Tampa, Florida. Uh, <laughs> excellent. A very wide range. So once again, I want to thank everyone for joining us for uh, this OIST Foundation webinar, uh, again, titled COVID-19 Science Update. I am David Jaynes of the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University and also the OIST Foundation. For those of you who don't know, the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University is an interdisciplinary graduate school offering a five-year PhD program in science. And the main task of OIST is to produce groundbreaking cutting edge research for the benefit of all humankind. And the OIST Foundation is a US-based 501c3 nonprofit that supports scientific breakthroughs, innovation, and the sustainable development of Okinawa through OIST. I'll tell you just a little bit about uh, ground rules for tonight's Zoom uh, webinar. We very much welcome everyone to ask questions uh, at any point in time. You can write those questions in chat or you can also use the Q&A. We'll collect those and during the latter part of the uh, uh, webinar, we'll have a chance for discussion and interaction. So we do welcome those at any point in time. Uh, this webinar is on the record and is being recorded. Let me uh, just very quickly uh, tell you who is joining us. I'm not going to go in depth into their backgrounds because uh, we wanna jump right in and hear directly from them. But joining us uh, this evening or this morning, if you're in Asia, is Dr. Mary Collins, uh, the provost uh, at OIST, Dr. Matthias Wolf, associate professor, uh, excuse me, uh, of molecular cryoelectron microscopy unit at OIST. We have Dr. Hiroki Ishikawa, associate professor in the immune signal unit and Dr. Amy Shen, Professor of the Microbio Nanofluidics Unit at OIST. I really wanna thank all of them for taking the time to join us uh, and share some of the highlights of things that they're working on. Uh, and I'll now turn it over without further ado to uh, Dr. Collins, again, the Provost at OIST. Mary. Well, uh, good morning from Okinawa. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to tell you two things from OIST. First of all is a piece of fascinating research from one of our um, uh, adjunct professors, Svanti Pabo. For those of you not following the history of human uh, evolution, you may not realize that we are actually hybrids between three species. We have Denisovans, we have Neanderthals, and we have early Homo sapiens. And it turns out that about 65,000 years ago, these three types of hominids were wandering the earth and interbreeding. And so a little bit like laboratory mice, but on a longer time scale, we are actually crosses between these three types of, of hominids. So Svanti Pabo, who discovered this fact, um, has done a beautiful piece of work to show that the most severe um, COVID-19 risk is inherited from Neanderthals. And this, to my mind, is one of the clearest bits of genetics that says that different populations in the world may be differentially susceptible to COVID-19. You'll see that North America has got um, a certain frequency of Neanderthal DNA. Um, and this is one of the things you find out if you send your genome to 23andMe. Whereas the Japanese population in general has a very low frequency. And I think this is interesting. And I think we will find later that this will be a very good way of looking at genetic predisposition to various things. Okay, so this is 
basic research and a, a wonderful article published from OIST. Next slide, please. Now, what I'm going to tell you about next is something much more practical, but no less useful, in fact. And I'm going to tell you about PCR testing for coronavirus and the work that we've done here at OIST. So this is really not research, this is implementation, but it's very important for things like modern tests to be implemented locally. Now the PCR test detects virus RNA. The first step is to make a DNA copy and then you go through amplification cycles to, in, to get um, a, finally a detectable amount of DNA. So you can see from our OIST data that after 20 to 30 cycles, you can detect DNA in saliva or um, uh, uh, swabs or sputum, okay? You can't detect it in blood. This is an airway virus, not a blood virus. And the important thing about this test is that it's highly sensitive and no virus gives no copies, no matter how many cycles. I mean, you can get a false positive if you mix up your samples, but that's the only way. So this is a sensitive and reliable test. And um, I think it's important to emphasize that implementing this test gives you very solid data as opposed to some of these rapid flow antigen or rapid flow antibody handheld tests. And so um, I think we started to do this, next slide please, um, uh, so uh, very few countries in the world have remained completely COVID free. And these are mostly very remote islands. But some countries have kept control of COVID by the principle of testing, tracing the contacts and isolating those contacts. And these include New Zealand, for example, and Taiwan. Okinawa very sadly lost control of COVID quite early. Um, it's a problem being an island that's part of a bigger country. We didn't have any testing at, at the airport in Okinawa. And the Japanese, what I would say was rather foolish go-to campaign to encourage tourism meant that there was quite enthusiastic flow of visitors from Tokyo to Okinawa. So we decided on the OIS campus to implement test trace and isolate policies to see if we could actually protect the OIS staff, students, families from coronavirus. Next slide, please. So from April to December last year, we did um, several types of test. We did clinical samples for Okinawa prefecture from the north of Okinawa, from the Yayama Islands and Miyakujima, and those tests were implemented essentially every day of the week if necessary. And we took throat swabs, uh, nasal swabs, sputum or saliva in varying types of tubes from clinics around the prefecture. We also did testing for local clinics such as uh, private clinics near the campus. And we tested oysters, oyster staff um, uh, and students when they returned from the mainland um, even if they had no symptoms. So if OIST uh, staff or students came back from the mainland with symptoms, they had to go to the local clinic, but we tested asymptomatic travelers by taking a sample of saliva on campus. Now this, uh, the, the graph at the bottom shows the number of tests. I don't expect you to read the numbers, but the blue peaks are uh, the, the, the first wave, the second wave of um, uh, infection. The, we did a lot of tests at one point in the second wave for the prefecture because there was an outbreak in the Yayama Islands. And these are the times when, when our staff, very dedicated staff, uh, a team of four people had to work through the weekend to provide um, accurate next day results. Um, go back, sorry. Uh, no, go forward. No, forward, forward. One more. Yeah, there we go. So um, the OIST test of asymptomatic travelers, um, we, we found no positives over a long period. But then this January, when um, people started returning from New Year's trips to Tokyo, we found three people um, who'd returned and had a positive PCR test. Continue. Next slide, please. So 
I'm now going to tell you what, what's going to happen. Okay. And, and what I think OIST's contribution has been. So when we started, OIST was one of three labs in Okinawa, which was testing every day when necessary with next day results. So this capacity of next day results, accurate testing by PCR has now expanded in Okinawa. And since December, we've not been providing these next day tests. But I would say that this accurate next day testing is not something that I've certainly seen implemented properly in the UK. Um, they lost control basically of testing and delivering results effectively. So I think we've provided a valuable sort of gold standard for testing here. And um, we've received letters of thanks from the governor and the, the, the vice governor in charge of health. Now, yesterday, um, we had an exciting uh, day when the number of positive tests in Okinawa went down under 20 for the first time for a long time. And we now have a new project, which is routine testing. And we've taken this project on from the prefectural government we're doing 6,000 routine tests for care home staff. This is a, a, a new phase where we're not expecting a lot of new outbreaks. We're hoping that the outbreaks are reduced, um, but we need to catch really vulnerable sites such as care home staff. Um, and we'll do the test those staff every couple of weeks along with other testing labs in Okinawa. Now, those three individuals that I told you about the travelers who had OIST tests that were positive, we managed to very quickly trace their contacts and isolate them. And that means we managed to keep the campus so far free of any person-to-person -person transmission. So these tests we're maintaining for travelers and for new arrivals to OIST, even though people are tested at their point of departure. And again, in Tokyo, we feel that the journey from Tokyo to Okinawa brings some, some hazards as well. And we're trying to, again, keep the campus kind of cordoned off. And the good news about this new phase is that we can take uniform samples. So this becomes an engineering project. Instead of taking different samples from clinics across the prefecture, we can take saliva samples in uniform barcoded tubes, and we can automate some parts of the PCR testing process. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mary, for that excellent presentation. Uh, I would now like to turn it over to Matthias Wolf. Uh, again, to remind everyone who's watching, Matthias Wolf is Associate Professor in the Molecular Cryoelectron Microscopy Unit at OIST. Uh, Matthias, I'll, I'll turn the floor to you. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. OK. Uh, Right, you get this full screen. Uh, yes, so uh, I'm going to talk about antibody tests. Um, in the end of March or so, in April last year, um, we learned that uh, the lab of uh, Dr. Florian Kramer in uh, New York, in Mount Sinai Medical School, um, had uh, published. Hello, can you still hear me? Yes. Somehow my, cam my camera is uh, doing weird things. Can you see me? Uh, we cannot see you, but we can hear you just fine. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I will try to get the camera back. Um, um, shall I just continue without camera? Sure. If you want to share your screen, that would be fine. Or I can share the slides from this end. Try it again. Uh, okay, there we are. Excellent. Share the screen. Sorry about this. So we have uh, started to do these antibody tests um, from earlier uh, in the year uh, or early summer last year. And um, 
Well, uh, let me first explain what antibody tests are. So uh, Dr. Collins has, has talked about uh, the PCR test. The PCR test detects the viral uh, genome. It detects uh, nucleic acid um, that's inside the, this enveloped RNA virus. Uh, antibody tests detect proteins that are in the surface uh, of this, uh, at the surface of, of this uh, lipid membrane. And uh, the coronavirus has its name um, because it's got these spike proteins that give it this crown-like structure. Um, the body makes antibodies against these uh, surface antigens, and uh, those can, can later be, be measured uh, in the blood. So antibodies are in the blood, but there's no virus in the blood. The virus uh, and the protein itself can be detected with PCR, which is extremely sensitive. It can detect uh, only a few copies of, of viruses. And, uh, and the antigens uh, are detected with so-called antigen tests uh, that is related to the antibody tests in terms of how it's done, but uh, it is not quite as sensitive and uh, it um, does not detect antibodies. It detects the, directly the, um, the spike protein. So in, as I mentioned uh, earlier last year, we, I asked uh, Dr. Kramer at Mount Sinai to send us his plasmids, uh, which he generously distributed to anyone who asked in the world. And uh, being a biochemistry work, uh, lab, we, you know, we were set up to make these proteins. So we expressed them in, in mammalian cells and, and purified them. And uh, we implemented uh, the two-step protocol developed by the Kramer lab, um, which is a, a very sensitive, it has, has around close to 100% sensitivity, it means it, it detects almost every, um, well, it, it, it has a high sensitivity to detect the protein. And it's also very specific, meaning it's specific to the, uh, this type of um, SARS coronavirus 2 that causes COVID-19. Um, protein and not not the common cold. Uh, there's another one, uh, another coronavirus that, that causes symptoms similar like the common cold. So it can distinguish between these two. And the two-step step assay is especially smart because uh, it, it combines this initial capture step where we use the receptor binding domain uh, that is very sensitive with this second follow-up step where all the positives are then screened um, at various dilutions using the full spike trimer protein. And you know, we are a structural biology lab, so we, we can look at these structures and they're all nicely folded, they are, they are properly expressed. And, and so we have very good protein. That is one of the hallmarks that distinguishes this test from um, say one of the rapid diagnostic tests where you have uh, dried protein on a paper strip. So this is all in solution and uses, you know, professional equipments like, like spectrophotometers, and it gives you a quantitative antibody titer in the end. Um, so just there's a, there's a difference when each test can be used. Um, after infection, it takes only two to three days for the RNA to be expressed, and uh, and and that it makes it makes virus and it makes copies, and so the viral load goes up very quickly after this, indicated by this uh, by this red line here, and uh, after this time, the PCR test is the most sensitive uh, modality to detect the virus. Um, after about eight to nine days, the immune system reaches a peak in, in, in what is called first the immunoglobulin M response, which is rather sort of unspecific. Um, and then followed by this, this gray phase here where the specific antibodies are produced. They're also called IgG. And at this time, around eight to nine days, up to 10 days afterwards, the viral, the viral titer drops dramatically. At this point, uh, the PCR becomes less uh, reliable and uh, it is better to detect antibodies. However, you know, the antibody test is not meant to be a diagnostic test because <clears throat> as, as uh, Dr. Collins said, uh, speed is paramount and if you want to trace and catch and isolate, uh, you have to do this quickly and the antibody test is not suitable for this. Um, after this, the question is how long are these antibodies present? Because upon reinfection, 
uh, there is an activation of immune cells, and I, I'm sure Professor Jikawa will talk uh, about this, um, that allows a much quicker ramping up of these uh, antibody productions, these cells that produce the antibody bodies. And, and uh, this will hopefully prevent symptoms and ideally replication of the virus. And uh, of course, um, this is something that we want to induce with the vaccine. So one question we, we did study in, in our project was how long antibodies can, can last. And uh, we worked with the hospital in, in Oromo City, the Chubu Hospital, uh, with uh, Dr. Masashi Narita, who provided samples to us. And uh, these patient samples, again, they are serum. Uh, they're, they're not infectious. We inactivate them, and, but we have a biosafety level facility where this can be done safely. And this graph illustrates that you know these antibodies that uh, were measured at multiple time points in in in, in this case in in one individual, but we have three uh, three individuals um, that they can last at least six months or longer. Uh, in this case, six and a half months. This graph shows different dilutions. Um, the highest dilution, uh, the, the highest dilution is at the bottom, and you see it drops below the threshold, and this is still very positive. The, uh, the last one is is below the threshold. So any, anyways, um, so there's hope that uh, once you are, have either had the disease or have been vaccinated, that you know this this will last for a while. And there's now also plenty of data now from from other studies that show that it can last nine months or even longer. Uh, so finally, what, what we did is we, we, we compared uh, blood from a finger prick taken by a little uh, lancet uh, that can be done at home with uh, venous blood, and it turned out that uh, uh, this, this is essentially equivalent. We made a, a small test kit uh, that uses a, a serum separation tube, this, this little tube that where, where a single blood drop is essentially enough to to do the assay and it's it is it's spun on a centrifuge and separated into serum and and uh, the blood clot and we implemented a, a yeah, QR code system to access the results online and did a study at OIST and so this this was done by uh, two postdocs essentially and two technicians in the lab and we partly also automated the the test on a on a liquid handler and we have so far tested around uh, 3500 people uh, all together, um, up to 6,000 for we have a contract with the Okinawan prefectural government. And uh, in this way, so we are, I'm very grateful that we can contribute, you know, to the well-being of people in, in Okinawa. Um, recently, we also um, tested the antibody status of firefighters and uh, of, of, of a professional organization. So in the end, uh, um, what the people want to know is whether they have antibodies. Until recently, we, it was not clear to tell whether uh, this will lead to protection. Um, there are several levels of, of protection, um, and that depends on the antibody titer. Um, usually, we don't disclose the antibody titer. We only say whether it's positive or negative. And uh, you know, even after vaccination, it uh, everyone should continue following these uh, isolation measures, including wearing a mask. Um, what is um, encouraging is that we have some recent data from uh, testing some um, individuals who were uh, vaccinated with the mRNA vaccine, and that turns out that uh, they they have a very high antibody titer, so the vaccine works, and I think that can give us optimism that uh, once a larger part of the population is, is vaccinated, that uh, indeed the vaccine, uh, sorry, the, the pandemic will slowly go down. And uh, there is now very strong data from Israel and also from care homes in the United States that the vaccine indeed works and the cases of, of uh, infection and also of uh, uh, fatalities is, is rapidly going down in these countries. Yeah, so I thank you very much for, for, for your attention. Thank you so much, Matthias, for that uh, very rich presentation. <clears throat> really appreciate it. Um, 
If you want to stop sharing, I will now turn the floor over to Dr. Hiroki Ishikawa. And uh, just to remind everyone, uh, Dr. Ishikawa is Associate Professor in the Immune Signal Unit at OIST. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, David. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, COVID-19 T-cell project uh, at OIST. So uh, in antiviral immune responses, uh, T cells are very important uh, because uh, they promote uh, the production uh, of uh, antibody uh, B cells. And they also uh, can kill the infected cells. So uh, these T cells and uh, antibody producing uh, B cells uh, induced uh, in the uh, primary infection. So uh, before the primary uh, infection, we usually uh, don't have uh, these uh, cells. And uh, uh, in the secondary infection, the, uh, uh, sorry, uh, these cells are maintained as memory T cells or memory B cells. So in the uh, secondary infection, these uh, cells quickly work and uh, effectively uh, eliminate uh, the viruses. So they are, uh, as uh, Matthias uh, mentioned, uh, in the case of uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, antibody responses, uh, the uh, un unexposed uh, people usually don't have the antibody, but uh, it's not the case uh, in T cell uh, immunity. So uh, this uh, is the uh, data from a group in the US so they, uh, they found that uh, 20 to 50% of unexposed donors have uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, responsive T cells. So uh, it's quite interesting. And uh, these cells might be derived from memory T cells generated in infection of a common uh, cold uh, coronaviruses. So uh, then, uh, a recent uh, study uh, confirmed uh, that this, this uh, was done in the UK and uh, it's the first large scale uh, study. So here there are two, more than 2000 uh, key workers uh, have been tested. And uh, so 13% uh, of people have both antibody and uh, T cell uh, responses. And uh, another 12% of people have uh, 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 didn't have antibody response, but uh, they have uh, uh, a large number of uh, T cells responsive to the viruses. And importantly, uh, the, uh, these uh, people who don't have antibody, but have the high level of T cell responses, uh, the, the, uh, 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 didn't uh, infect, uh, didn't get infection of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 in the follow-up study. So they are on this uh, red line, they are completely uh, resistant. Uh, so this is PCR test result. So they are negative in the 120 days uh, after uh, the uh, test. So uh, it seems that uh, the pre-existing pre uh, T cells are quite important for anti uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, immunity. So uh, in, at OIST, uh, uh, we have uh, also done the uh, T cell test uh, for Okinawan people. The, uh, uh, the first aim uh, is to describe T cell responses to uh, SARS-CoV-2 in Okinawa uh, people. So Okinawa uh, is uh, uh, they are a small island isolated from the, uh, uh, the main island and close to China. So it's uh, quite a uh, unique uh, 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 the, uh, geographical feature. And uh, compared to the US or UK, so the, the previous studies have done, so the uh, COVID-19 situation is quite different. So they are here on the cases and the deaths per 1 million population shown there. Uh, so it's uh, almost 10% uh, of the uh, US and UK in Japan. 
So and uh, second aim is to investigate the relationship between aging and uh, SARS-CoV-2 responsive T cells. So uh, then uh, we used early spot assay to uh, measure SARS-CoV-2 responsive T cells. So this is uh, one of the most uh, accurate and uh, sensitive uh, methods to detect uh, T cell uh, responses. So then, uh, we collect the blood uh, from the donor and uh, purify the uh, peripheral uh, blood mononuclear cells and uh, uh, culture them with the uh, T cell antigen uh, peptides. So, so these are from SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, membrane protein, and uh, nuclear capsid proteins. And mix them and uh, cult uh, culture them in uh, uh, anti-interferon gamma coated plate for 16 hours. So then the uh, SARS-CoV-2 responsive T cells secrete uh, cytokine interferon gamma, the, uh, which uh, makes spot uh, in the well. So then we can count the spot and uh, and uh, uh, the measure the number of SARS-CoV-2 responsive T cells. So uh, so this is the result. So they, uh, uh, we tested uh, uh, about 30 uh, uh, COVID-19 unexposed, unexposed people, uh, young and uh, elderly population, and also uh, just three. It's difficult to uh, get the uh, COVID-19 uh, recovered uh, patients in Okinawa. So just, uh, we yeah, have just a few samples. So here uh, we can see that, uh, that most of our, our young people have the uh, relatively constant numbers uh, of the, uh, uh, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 responsive T cells, about uh, 40 to uh, uh, 100. In contrast, uh, the, in the uh, elderly population, some people have uh, a significantly high number of uh, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 responsive T cells, but uh, many people uh, don't have uh, the respons responsive cells. And uh, these numbers are uh, quite similar to uh, uh, the level uh, observed uh, in the uh, COVID-19 uh, recovered uh, patients. So in the uh, young, the, in the uh, uh, COVID-19 exposed uh, donors, uh, young adults uh, showed uh, about 70% positive, and all uh, positive means uh, the more than 40 uh, spots, and the older adults showed uh, 46%. And then uh, we looked at the response uh, to uh, individual uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, proteins. So the spike uh, nuclear capsid uh, and uh, membrane. So, uh, so interestingly, uh, the, uh, we can see a lot of uh, the uh, uh, T cells responsive to the SARS-CoV-2 uh, membrane protein particularly uh, in the, uh, the uh, 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 older adults here. So uh, it's much higher than the responses uh, against other the, uh, uh, antigens. And, uh, uh, but the, uh, in COVID-19 recovered patients, we can see uh, the similar responses to uh, all the uh, uh, viral proteins. So, uh, so in summary, uh, uh, the frequency of SARS-CoV-2 responsive T cells is relatively constant in uh, young adults, while uh, it is more variable in uh, older adults. And uh, in Okinawa, uh, SARS-CoV-2 unexposed people, particularly uh, older, uh, older adults, uh, viral M protein is the major target for the T cell uh, responses. And uh, so these uh, assays were done by uh, uh, mainly uh, Naoyuki Taiwa, and uh, Mary is our uh, advisor. And uh, we are going to uh, establish uh, the uh, automated teacher test with uh, Professor uh, Kitano and uh, Dr. Arakaki. And uh, we are uh, collaborating with uh, these uh, physicians uh, in local uh, clinics and hospital uh, in Okinawa. Yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you so much, Hiroki, for that uh, excellent presentation. And I would now like to uh, turn the floor over to Dr. Amy Shen, uh, and again, as a reminder, Dr. Shen is 
professor in the microbio nanofluidics unit at OIST. Thank you very much. And the floor is yours, Amy. Thank you, David. Can you see my slides? Yes, I can. OK, that's great. Um, good morning and evening, everyone. So I'm Amy Shen. So I, I lead the um, uh, microbial nanofluidics unit. And so this slide shows some of the work we do. Uh, so I'm not trained as a biologist, but as an engineer. And so we develop, uh, so in my group, so we, we develop uh, many palm-sized uh, lab-on-a-chip devices to study both fundamental and applied research. And uh, so in this case, uh, in particular, so we combine both nanotechnology and microtechnology to develop chips for disease di diagnostic applications, and which is uh, related to um, the COVID-19 antibody test that we'll uh, talk about today. And so, um, so in principle, uh, so when you design um, a diagnostic uh, platform, so you want to trace the biomarkers in uh, a bodily fluids, for example, either urine or blood plasma and so on. And so this is a simple schematic and how uh, things work for designing a detection platform. And so we need just some important features um, to, um, to remind you. So, so there are three important features that's important. One is the selectivity, sensitivity, and the speed of detection. Um, so to do that, so we have to select the proper recognition molecule and uh, that's able to capture the biomarkers. So in this case, um, so if you're interested in detecting COVID, that will be the antigen. But for our case, we're interested in the antibody detection. So that will be the antibody as the biomarker. And finally, we also need to quantify uh, the detected biomarkers once when these two molecules bind. And to do that, so, there, so we can group uh, two uh, um, typical detection methods. So, so one we call label type and which uh, means that the detection can be signified by like a color changes or fluorescent uh, and so on. And so these techniques are pretty simple, inexpensive, but with lower resolution. So another method, uh, so we group that as label free and meaning that we can uh, uh, capture the detection by either electrical signal or optical signal, so on and so forth. And they tend to yield higher resolution and with real-time analysis, but they tend to be more expensive and complex. And so our detection platform is based on the optical method called localized surface plasma resonance. And uh, so, so what is this technique actually? Um, so the, the major principle can be traced back to very ancient time. So this movie here, so that's the famous Lycagus cup, the Roman Lycagus cup, which is currently still on the exhibit in a, a London museum. And when you shine the light at different angles, you will see different colors, either pinkish or greenish color. So they correspond to uh, gold uh, versus silver nanoparticles that are embedded in the glass. And so we're going to essentially, so the, the different color changes uh, represents um, basically the different uh, uh, biomolecule binding kinetics. Uh, so we can use this principle to develop a microfluidic platform to develop the concentration of antibodies against uh, the COVID viruses and such. And so this schematic shows, so if you have like a, a gold nanostructure and such, so when you shine the light, you will get a, a resonance peak. And when there's any molecules um, binding to this structure, so you're going to see a wavelength shift. And when there's a further uh, biomolecule interaction, so you can see another further wavelength shift. So, so we can create um, a calibration curve and then correlate that with the, the biomarkers concentration. And uh, so to, to use this measurement principle, so we, we first, as I mentioned, we need to design a, a nanostructured uh, uh, substrate uh, serving as uh, we call the nanoplasmonic uh, platform. And so in this case, so we use a very simple electro deposition um, platform. So we're able to, to form these, we call the gold nanospikes and they're optically active. So meaning, um, so they're very sensitive to the local refractive index 
um, variations and therefore corresponding to any biomolecules um, adhere to these uh, uh, nanospikes on the substrate. So the next step, um, so we have uh, also, um, it involves um, quite complex surface chemistry and also uh, assemble that into a microfluidic device coupled with um, optical fiber probes and also um, detection platform. And just, so this is uh, essentially the final uh, assembly of our platform. And the chip here, it's very tiny. It's uh, on the order of a tiny, uh, it's a smaller than 100 yen Japanese coin. Um, so, uh, so here are some results. And uh, so since, uh, uh, so we purchased all the biomarkers um, uh, from different companies to begin with, but to validate our platform's performance. So we just use, uh, first we use the standard um, IgG antibody detection in PBS just to validate. And then we eventually we move towards the anti-SARS-CoV spike protein antibody detection in human plasma. And so, so this is um, an example of the, our detection platform um, uh, resonance curve. So this is the wavelength versus time corresponding to different antibody concentrations. And so we can perform both calibration and also focus on how to improve the selectivity and uh, also the sensitivity of the platform. And just very briefly, so this curve here shows uh, so that's the wavelength versus time. And um, so if we have diluted human plasma without um, any antibodies, as you can see, the signal is flat. But so when the plasma is doped with uh, antibodies, so you can see this uh, very large jump on the order of um, uh, five to six nanometers. And so if you look at uh, this figure here, so now if you're given like an unknown sample, and so what we can do is, uh, so using our platform, so we can obtain a given wavelength shift. Let's say if uh, your sample yields a four nanometer, then we go to this curve. And uh, so follow this curve. So, so the four nanometer corresponds to, let's say 0.9 nanogram per mil. So, so that's uh, essentially the concentration. So in your sample. And so for our device, so we're able to achieve uh, high sensitivity. So on the order of uh, 0.5 uh, picomolar, which falls under the clinical relevant concentration. So we can also um, complete this process within 30 minutes. And so in comparison to some of the commercially available detection platforms, so usually you can group that under either lateral flow assays, which, uh, which is faster than our platform, but on the other hand, uh, so the lateral flow assays will only does not provide the quantitative information. It only tells you yes or no. And uh, so another uh, general type, it's based on ELISA, so which uh, uh, Professor Wolf and Ishikawa have been also using a similar setup in their labs. And, um, but on the other hand, they rely on signal amplification uh, based on either enzyme or um, fluorescence to enhance the detection sensitivity and the cost is um, uh, higher. And, uh, and on the other, and, and also, so, so with our setup, um, we require ve very little sample volume because it's based on lab on the chip devices. So overall, so our hope is it's going to reduce uh, the assay cost and to make, make the devices or assays kits a lot cheaper. Um, so to, to summarize, so our work is very engineering oriented. And uh, so we, uh, at the moment, we provide a proof of concept sensing platform. So we're able to provide uh, to detect the antibodies. Um, so against the COVID spike protein uh, with high sensitivity and uh, within 30 minutes. And uh, so I also want to emphasize that all the samples, so we have been using, using our platform. So they are uh, essentially um, provided by either companies or our collaborators from Recan. And so we haven't actually tested the real patient samples. So that will be our next step. And uh, so we want to improve um, the sensitivity of our device. And we're also currently developing, we call the multiplexing um, platform. So, so we want to detect antibodies against other um, COVID structural proteins 
and also uh, so so we're also collaborating uh, with some researchers uh, for vaccine development as well. Uh, so our eventually our goal is to collaborate also with local hospitals to perform assays with uh, real patient samples, and uh, so I'm also hope hoping to also have uh, initiate some collaborations with Professor Wolf and also Professor, uh, Professor Ishikawa. So based on some of their recent development. Um, so, so this work is mainly um, done by uh, my postdoc, um, Dr. Funari, and who's um, actually going to leave very soon. He got a faculty position back to Italy and also PhD student uh, at OIST, uh, um, uh, Kang Yu Chu. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions and I will end here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy, for, for that excellent presentation. Really appreciate it. We have uh, about 15 minutes and a, and a good number of uh, questions that have come in. And I think the first question that uh, is a rather interesting one uh, is in regard to uh, you know, switching from whatever you were researching or studying prior to COVID uh, and then kind of shifting gears and, and studying um, COVID. The particular uh, question is how many laboratories, I assume at, at, at OIST or, or researchers at OIST uh, are switching their work to focus on COVID-19 and will continue studying it. I wonder, maybe Mary, I could turn to you first and you could, you could give a kind of sense of that. Yeah, no, I can talk in general. So, so this morning we've run through the immune system and the, the virus. Um, and so these are the labs that are, that are working on the biology. Um, we've had some people also work on how to make masks, um, how to sterilize masks. And we've have some of our um, computer modelers have been looking at um, modeling the epidemic. So I would say maybe um, th these are obviously our stars, <laughs> these three. Um, plus uh, some maybe three people looking at masks and mask structure and two or three people looking at um, uh, uh, epidemiology. So that would be about 10 labs, right? Um, and I, I think actually that these people, but they'll speak for themselves. Most people have taken it on as a side project, but have become kind of interested as the pandemic seems to grow in importance and be really significant for the future, basically. I think it's not a thing that's going to be over. And so many of the projects are continuing, at least in part in these labs, because the global pandemic will be with us for a while. Thank you. I wonder, Amy, I wonder if you could comment on that. You know, what was it like to kind of shift uh, the focus of some of your research? And, and you've done some amazing outreach as well to the community. Yeah, so, so, so that's a very good point. So actually in my group, uh, in my unit, I have uh, kind of two uh, interacting groups. So uh, one group, uh, it's mainly kind of consisting of uh, PhD students and they, they have been very interested in working on biotechnology related problems. And uh, so two PhD students, they have been working on actually developing very similar uh, detection platforms for cancer research. And uh, so, so when the pandemic started, so we had a very uh, brief meeting. So we decided actually we can use very similar kind of design concept. And, uh, but of course, surface chemistry and the biomolecules will be very different, you know, with the cancer research versus uh, the COVID-19. But so for us, it's a very natural kind of extension of what we're doing. And the students and the postdoc became also very highly motivated. Um, and just some other people from my group who are actually working more on the fun fundamental like fluid mechanics research and um, on more engineering kind of uh, fabrication uh, work, they also decided to join the effort to help actually making a workable detection platform within really just uh, on the order of uh, two, three months. And uh, so, so, so from my slides, as you can see, so to make a functional device, so you, you need people kind of in engineering, making kind of uh, everything fits. And also, so people who knows, understands optics, biology, and also chemistry. So, so that's a joint effort. Really interesting. Uh, Matthias or Hiroki, did you want to comment at all on, on that? 
I'll be brief. Uh, so we are a structural biology lab, and uh, originally we got into this because uh, we worked on Ebola virus, nuclear protein, RNA complex before, and the coronavirus has a similar uh, nucleocapsid structure. So we thought, you know, by cloning and expressing the, the nuclear protein, uh, that would, you know, lead to a, a structure and a good publication. And that was the initial uh, motivation. Also, uh, actually, when I uh, introduced my, my lab members to you know, this this evident problematic of the pandemic, everyone embraced it enthusiastically. And uh, I found it very invigorating, actually, and, and stimulating to um, work as a team on, uh, on these different projects. And we have uh, at least five different projects, you know, targeting different uh, uh, antigens. And, and so this was very... Uh, interesting but by no means we are not a clinical lab we are not we're doing this sort of on the side the testing on is not meant to be as a as a service for you know it is not we are not uh, we are neither licensed for this nor nor are we doing this um, kind of as a as a it's it's a, it's supplementing the public service you know like there is no uh, our results are not not guaranteed. They are not validated, even though I think they are. I mean, they are validated internally, but they are not sort of officially approved. Um, as the question suggested, you know, this uh, or is this not a, a clinical? We, we don't have a clinical setup here. Um, so, so in a way, this is all under the category research. And uh, for the future, this is what uh, it's going to remain. Uh, you know, Dr. Collins may have other plans for increasing the capacity, but uh, yes. <laughs> okay, so I'll leave it there. Th thank you so much. Um, let me, th there's a number of questions and we'll try to get through as many as we can quickly. There's one here that says, can we say conclusively that all the asymptomatic cases will have existing T cells, memory T cells, and hence show no symptoms and defend against the novel coronavirus? Uh, Hiroki or Mary? We, we, oh, oh, yeah. Uh, I think uh, we cannot make a conclusion now. The uh, uh, case uh, numbers are quite small uh, in, in in that report. So, uh, yeah, we don't know yet. And uh, we just uh, measured the number of uh, uh, T cells uh, that can respond to the SARS-CoV-2, but we don't know the characteristics of those cells. So there are in the future studies, uh, we should uh, know more about the T cell immunity against uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Mary, did you want to comment or? Excellent. Uh, there's, uh, there's a question here about false positives. And uh, I'm not sure if, if that might be uh, Matthias or, or Amy or, or Mary, but uh, the question is, could you explain a bit more about how false positives uh, occur. Um, sure, I, I'll, I'll start anyway. Um, so, so for PCR, there really aren't any unless you scramble the tubes up somehow. So um, there are no false positives. Um, and that's, I think, why the PCR test is kind of important. Um, but obviously, you could be positive for the virus the day after your sample was taken. So it's, it's the, in time, you can clearly become positive. But on the day of that sample, there's no virus in your nose. Maybe I can just go to antibodies very briefly also. Uh, the, the test that Matthias has set up is very specific for SARS-CoV-2 and there really are no false positives. This has been demonstrated by a number of studies. Um, that's what Amy's working on with her device to look at specificity, basically. And as you can see from the T cells, there are already many pre-existing responses, but T cells are super complicated to measure. So we don't really know what a response is. I, I can maybe add a little bit to this. So, you know, the, the first step, uh, because it is so sensitive, does have uh, a false positive rate associated with it, which is, which is about 5%. But the combination of the two steps um, reduces this dramatically. And uh, indeed, the test is, the overall false positive rate is very low. Uh, however, you know, if you would use this um, in, for population scale statistics, 
you 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 really need the numbers, you know, like any test to come up with uh, reliable statistics. And with the numbers of um, of people that we have tested, there is uh, these are not enough essentially to uh, as, assign a statistically reliable, you know, measure to say that this number is accurate. Uh, however, we have uh, essentially every single confirmed positive sample that was PCR positive was positive in the antibody test. So within uh, the realm of, of our experiments, uh, it is absolutely correct you know, that the test has a very high uh, accuracy. Thank you very much, Matthias. Let me try to get in one or two other uh, questions here. Uh, there is uh, a question as follows, uh, and it's for anyone. Uh, is there a role of uh, immunoglobulin A in protection against SARS-CoV-2 as its primary route of infection is through the respiratory mucosa? Well, that's one for our properly trained immunologist, Ishikawa Sensei. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I, I'm not familiar with that. Matthias? <laughs> Uh, sorry, I, I expected you to answer. What, what was the question? <laughs> so I think that's too hard for us, David. Okay. <laughs> that's from a, a great colleague at, at Harvard uh, Medical School um, asking that. I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to you. Um, so let me ask a question uh, that's coming in from um, Isamu Ota of uh, Misawa Homes. Uh, which is a company that has had a, a longstanding uh, relationship with OIST. Uh, and he particularly would like to ask you, Matthias, I, I think you in a way answered some of this earlier, but uh, whether antibody testing conducting, conducted in OIST includes people coming from other parts of Japan, for example, Tokyo as a temporary visitor or those professors and co-researchers commuting from other parts of Japan. So, so the bottom line is, uh, um, so far not, but we don't discriminate. I mean, um, uh, so, you know, we, I'm, my lab is a research lab and we do this on the side. Uh, in a way, we don't want this to go national. Um, we, we're doing our best to contribute here, but uh, I think in order to scale this up, we, we have the tools to scale it up, you know, the, uh, essentially with the automation and uh, and the reagents, the reagents need to be produced, you know, that requires also effort and investment, but uh, we don't have the personnel and we don't have the time within the scope of my research unit. So to make this go broad scale, I think it would have to be outsourced into some sort of uh, dedicated company. And at the moment, there is no plan for this. Thank you. And Matthias, since you're, since you're on at the moment, uh, a question came in just for you. Uh, just curious if the mutated UK coronavirus strain has some structural change at spike protein that could impact therapeutic responses, including... Right. So I, I, I do think... I, oh, sorry, sorry, Mary, go ahead. No, you go. Yeah, I, I do think I can answer this. So uh, with respect to the ELISA test that we are using, of course, you know, the, the, the antigen that is presented on the ELISA plate uh, determines the pattern that is detected. And uh, we, we are still using the original sort of Wuhan type uh, sequence that uh, uh, has in the meantime mutated and resulted in these different lineages that now, now one of the strains in, in no, no, not strains, but variants that came up in, in, in UK and in South Africa. We, we, we essentially, we don't know whether this will be detected, but uh, it turns out that there is evidence for the uh, Moderna and Pfizer vaccines that they are they have efficacy against um, the, the the UK type. Apparently, the South African type uh, has uh, another cluster of of mutations on the receptor binding domain that uh, that make it harder. So the the efficacy there is apparently only in the order of of sixty percent. But sixty percent is still above what everyone was hoping for when the vaccines were originally designed. So, so I think uh, we can be fairly confident that at least these vaccines will prevent disease, whether they can prevent you know, the 
reinfection and uh, shut down the pandemic, that's that's another question. But, uh, you know, the virus constantly evolves and there may be escape mutants in the future that don't respond to the virus and we just don't know that yet. Well, thank you so, so much. Um, amazingly, an hour goes by much too fast and uh, there are many questions we didn't get to, but I want to just give everyone a uh, of our panelists a quick chance to make any final remarks. Uh, inevitably, there are some questions about the effectiveness of vaccines. Uh, one person wants to know if this is going to be around indefinitely, uh, but I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Mary first, and, and then uh, we'll go around the room and see if there are any final remarks I'd like to make. Mary. Um, well, I think OIST is, is committed to continuing to support Okinawa. Um, it's all very well having concepts in the world, but some of these things have to be done locally. And I'm really grateful to my colleagues at OIST for turning their hand to some of these problems. Amy, I'll turn it to you. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, I, I think uh, following up with uh, uh, Matthias' uh, comments and Mary's, um, I think, yeah, so, so the, the mutations and uh, you know the new variants, so they're unpredictable. But uh, so we're also hopeful. So with our platform, um, um, so since it's still proof of concept, but we also have advantages to, for example, to start from uh, from the beginning to immobilize the, for example, the the antigens and so on the, uh, related to the spike proteins. Um, so hopefully we can also yeah reach out to some collaborators to to make more headways on that. Thank you so much, uh, Amy and Hiroki. I'll turn to you next. Oh yeah, so uh, yeah, so, uh, it's difficult to predict the uh, uh, emergence of uh, the mutant viruses. So uh, yeah, I believe that T cell uh, responses uh, may play a role. Uh, Pre-existing pre T cells may play a role uh, uh, in the uh, host defense against those things. So uh, yeah, I want to study more about that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rookie. And uh, last but not least, Matthias. Thank you. Well, I'm all, always uh, optimistic. So I, I think, uh, you know, the, the new data from, from Israel and, and other countries now, like where the vaccine is sort of broadly rolled out, where they almost reach now the, this, this level of 65 to 70 percent of what they call herd immunity, uh, that is very encouraging. And so I, I think uh, ultimately we'll get a hold of this pandemic. But the re reality is that in Japan alone, there are more than 120 million people. And uh, at the rate of uh, 1 million vaccinations per, per, per day, which is now like happening in the United States, it still takes, you know, 120 days. Uh, and then you have to do another booster shot. So uh, uh, we haven't even started yet. So which means, you know, 2021 is already over, you know, so it won't happen in 2021, but it will definitely get better. And I think we can look forward towards 2022. And, you know, innovations like uh, Professor Chen's microfluidics device, which can get away with uh, very small amounts and also be very sensitive and rapid, uh, are going to be uh, you know, important in this because test, trace, and isolate is currently the only way how you can uh, control this pandemic. So I think uh, as, a, as a message, everyone should uh, count on continuing these uh, social distancing measures and uh, the mask wearing for this year. Well, thank you so much, uh, Matthias, for that. And uh, uh, again, I want to thank all of our panelists and the audience for joining us uh, this first day of the Lunar New Year and also uh, the first uh, US-Japan science webinar for the OIST Foundation. Let me um, uh, just uh, let everyone know that there are a variety of wonderful comments in the chat. Uh, I'll just read one because I think our panelists will enjoy it. It says, thank you so much, Dr. Collins, Dr. Wolf, Dr. Ishikawa, and Dr. Shen for a wonderful presentation. My love for OIST grows as I see how flexible and how forward moving everyone is. So. Uh, I'd like to add to that and thank you all and thank the audience for joining us. Uh, and I'd like to let everyone know that if you go to oistfoundation.org, oistfoundation.org, you can find out about our next uh, webinars. And the next one is on uh, US East Coast time, 7 p.m. the Thursday, February 18th. Uh, it features Dr. Keshav Dani and is titled Into the Darkness, The Hunt for the Forbidden Exciton. Uh, so I hope you'll all join us for that. Uh, once again, thank you all so much. Have a great evening if you're in the U.S. and a great day if you're in Japan. Thank you.
Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.